Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today, we're going to restore a radio from the 1940s. This radio was made by the Majestic Radio Corporation. It really is such a nice looking radio that it does warrant a full restoration. So not only are we going to repair and restore this radio, we're going to make it perform the way it performed when it rolled off the factory production line. So together, we'll bring this radio back to life. So grab your favorite snack, sit back, and enjoy as I take you through the entire restoration process. All right, let's see what we're up against today. Here you are sitting right beside me at the bench. Let's bring this thing back to life together. Let's make this thing perform the way it did back in the 1940s. So the first thing I noticed about this radio receiver is its looks. It has a really attractive design to it. Whoever designed this radio did a really, really nice job. It really does stand out above a lot of the All-American 5 radios. Another thing is, is this thing looks like it came out of the box. The finish on it, the paint, everything is so incredibly nice. Now, at first glance, you look at this and you'd think, wow, you know, brand spanking new radio or something like that. And then, you know, when you look a little bit closer, there are no runs. The paint is perfectly even. The finish that they chose for this is a satin finish. Looks really, really nice. This radio, here's the thing, this radio was issued in this color, and it was also issued in walnut. Now, what tells me that somebody painted this thing is, is when you look at the bottom, I see some runs, and somebody didn't mask this off very well. If they would have taken the time to do that and clean everything up, it would have been you know, very, very hard to tell that this was actually painted. Whoever did this did an incredibly nice job, aside from these you know, runs on the bottom. But again, this is going to be down like this. Nobody would ever see that, right? But other than that, as you can see, like it's just, you know, the paint is really looking around the radio on the top sides. And even down in here, you know, there's just, there's no flaws whatsoever. It's just on the bottom. So a really nice job. Another interesting thing about this radio is if we look, the speaker cutout is on the side of the radio. They didn't put the speaker in the front of this radio or on this side, which is kind of a neat idea because a lot of the times these things sat in the kitchen. And when they sit in the kitchen, they're usually facing the person that's doing whatever they're doing in the kitchen and food splatters on these things and liquid splatter on these things. I've had quite a few All-American 5 style radios with liquid damaged speakers. So if anything was to ever splash on this thing, chances are it's not going to damage the speaker. So when we open this thing up, we're going to discover all of the issues with this thing together here. When I open this thing up, we'll see if the speaker is in good condition or not. Now there always is that chance that you know some technician over time has you know, poked his finger through it or dropped a screwdriver on it or something like that. But I sure hope not. It, uh, it sure looks like it's in just, you know, fantastic condition on the outside. On the back side of the radio, this looks like this has been wiped down with some cleaner or something like that. You can see that's really faded. Another interesting thing here, it says re-examination service. Underwriters Laboratories. Interesting, so way back in the day, it, these things got re-examined. Very interesting. As you can see here, you can see the paint right here so it kind of tells you for sure that the thing was painted if it was just sitting and you couldn't actually touch this radio if it was sitting behind glass and it was just sitting there like that you wouldn't know really it is that nice and i'm hoping that is portrayed through the camera so again you know looking at the bottom it's definitely tell it was masked off and we can see it looks like overspray or something on the inside here you can see that so when we take the back off and take a look inside, we'll see what's going on inside there. I'm excited to do that because at this point, you know as much about this radio as I do, aside from just looking at the aesthetics of this thing. On the face here, the dial looks nice and clean. There are no cracks in the glass. That's a real bonus. Nobody has wiped off the numbering and lettering on the inside. That's something that you always have to be very, very careful with on these radios when you clean them on the inside. Sometimes water will take this stuff right off. So you have to try, you know, a very mild cleaner and sometimes just water itself in a very inconspicuous area because there would be nothing worse than, you know, rubbing an area and say you took the 160 off or something like that. I have horror stories about water decals 
I had one one dial with a water decal on it, and I didn't know it was a water decal, and I rinsed it with water, and the whole dial just floated off. That wasn't a good day. That was way, way, way back when, many, many, many years ago. So, in order to get inside this thing, it looks like we're going to have to take off some screws. Usually what they did with these is they would fasten them on the bottom with screws, or they would fasten them from the back sides. The, the chassis slides in, and they fasten the chassis like this, and then the top portion here of this is usually what holds the, you know, the the top of the antenna on. As you can see, this says outside antenna, but there is a, an antenna on the inside of this thing as well. I can feel that right now. So we'll remove these four screws and hopefully this will slide out. And of course, the knobs will be holding this thing in as well. So I'll pull this off here like so. And I'm here, I'll grab a screwdriver. Let's move these out of the way. Turn this back around like so. Okay. Now one thing's for sure, they're not very tight and that's a nice thing because if you over tighten these things, they crack the Bakelite case. So it's never worth over tightening anything like this. A lot of people don't seem to have any feeling when they're tightening these things. They're tightening them super tight, and then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you've got a crack across the case. So, very, very snug, and that's it. They don't need to be incredibly tight. So, this here would look like this should be it, I'm hoping. So, let's see. Now, usually, these will just fall out and lift this up. Just like so. Look at that. Yeah, lots of overspray in there. Look at that. It can definitely be cleaned up. Somebody has over tightened this one area. Look at that. A little bit of a crack there. I guess that's why this one screws a little longer than the rest of them. I'll just move this out of the way, but then in a very safe area. If I damage that case, that would be. Absolutely horrible. Oh, there's even overspray on the inside of the radio. Look at this. Looks like primer or something has been sprayed on this. It's got a nice little red tinge to everything. So that'll all have to come off. The tubes have even been sprayed. Yeah, I can feel it. So, yeah. Okay, here's the, the moment of truth. Let's take a look at the speaker. Look at that. It's flawless. A little bit of a dent here, but nothing's pierced through, and it's fine. The movement of the speaker is absolutely fine. That speaker is in excellent condition. One thing that is kind of important to do if you're going to be handling these things a lot is cut out a piece of cardboard and put a piece of cardboard over this. So while you're working on the radio, you don't accidentally poke your finger through the paper of the speaker. It is common. It is common because you're not thinking when you're moving this thing around, especially when you're changing components and things like that. You know, and it's all it takes is a slip of a screwdriver or your finger, and you've ruined that very nice factory speaker. So the antenna looks like it's in nice condition. The dial glass looks like it's in very good condition. So chances are. What they did is they had a glass cutter and they cut the corners off like so, and you can see they've chipped this off, so it didn't chip off quite as even as this corner did, but it's still in very nice condition. It's dirty, so I'll have to be very, very careful with that. One thing that looks really odd about this is that there is no screws holding this thing together. So it looks like it's just a clip that's been pushed on the side. So I'll have to very carefully, yeah, there we go, very carefully remove these, put them back on, and that'll hold the dial glass in place. That'll allow me to remove this, and I can clean that. In fact, you want to know something? Well, I'll just leave it on there for now. It looks like it would very easily come off, so I just take this little clip and just slide this right out. I'll show you that. So just remove this like so. And I'll, I'm going to grab this in an area that's I'm not touching any of the lettering. And if I pull on this, you can see that it'll just come right off. I can just pull this little clip off myself here. And that dial glass comes out like so. And, you, you know, I want to be extremely careful with this. I don't want to damage this at all. 
be very, very careful while I'm cleaning this. So what I'll do is I'll try a cleaner underneath this area. So out of the, you know, out of the viewing angle. So if any of this paint comes off, then, you know, you got to be very careful and clean around all the numbering and all the lettering. So sometimes that can be a very time consuming process. This here, as you can see, is going to need some, some cleaning as well. So I'll just move this out of the way over here, somewhere extremely safe. Get these things out of here. One less thing to break. Here's another look at the top side of the chassis from a different angle. And we can see all the dust and debris and crud stuck to the surface, so that'll all have to be cleaned off. Notice even the tuning capacitors on a little bit of an angle here. You can see all of the overspray on the side of the chassis and the IF transformer and on the tubes and everything, so that'll all have to get cleaned off. But that's the easy stuff. Let's take a look at the underside of the chassis. So I'm going to grab the chassis like this, being very careful around that speaker. So I'll hold this like this. I'm going to grab this here like so, and just turn it upside down like that. And wow, what a mess. So obviously there has been some people in here over the years. I'll just zoom on in a little bit so I can get a bit closer to, to what's going on under here. So many things. Where to start? I'll start with a line cord. So you see the line cord running in right here through a little restraint over here to this lug on the tube socket. As you can see, there's copper just kind of dangling right here. This almost looks like a cold solder joint onto the side of that lug. Nice sharp piece of something left over there and this is right up against it. Now the lugs get hot because the vacuum tubes get extremely hot in service and as you can see that little sharp piece is pointing right at that line cord. I'll just zoom in here a little bit more so I can get a little bit closer to what's going on. So I'll just move some of this out of the way. Look at that piece of leftover wire or something right here. See that? I'll just point to that with this screwdriver here. And this is just right up against it just like that. Until I bent it out of the way. So some pretty scary workmanship there. Look at this. And this. And this. And this. Oh, it just doesn't stop. Okay, so I'll back this away just a moment and we'll take a little closer look at what's going on in here. All right. So, again, where to start? So, looking at this audio transformer, this looks like a replacement. I can see the wires are just kind of draped over and tacked into places. If we look at that screw, it's not even tightened down on the bottom. Yeah, the transformer's just kind of hanging here. See that right down in here where my thumb is? Just kind of hanging there. That screw's not threaded in at all. On this side it is. This side's loose. Why not just tighten up the other side? Kind of strange. Filter capacitor is bad, so somebody clipped out a bad section, just kind of hanging in there. And then we have this lead, which has been burnt in multiple places, melted with a soldering iron, tacked in over here. This obviously is a replacement capacitor of some sort, just laying in here. Oh, look at that. It's not even connected on the other side. Maybe that was supposed to be connected to the chassis. So it was just tucked in there. Well, that's nice. So, there's that. Let's move that out of the way. I want that to poke through the speaker. I'll just put this on the back side here, let it hang over the back side. Lots of original capacitors, horribly electrically leaky capacitors everywhere. About the best capacitor in here is this one. This one here will most likely still be good. But, um, yeah, all the rest of them. And aside from the mica here, this mica will most likely be okay. Look at that. Wow. Just. An incredible mess. Now this one here, this capacitor here looks like it's been extremely hot and that one ties from a ground portion to the chassis. So this is tying from one side of the AC line basically to the chassis and look at how hot it's been. It's actually discolored. Now 
Many times these things are called death capacitors because these are the ones that short and make the chassis live. So there's a lot of things that they did back in the days to keep these chassis away from your fingers, things like that. You'll notice that the knobs on the front don't have any set screw on them. They just have a, a, a spline inside them. And then if you look at the actual little shaft on the front, they have a split inside them. So if they get loose, you can put a little screwdriver in here and very carefully you give it a bit of a pry. Now you have to be extremely careful with that because a lot of these things are aluminum. And if you do that, and even the ones that are brass like this, if you give them just a little bit too much, they'll break right in here. So that has to be done extremely careful and slow. And you, you part these things like so, and then they, they grip inside the little knob quite a bit nicer. You can see how that's nice and tight on there and that holds right to that. So another thing to do if you think that, you know, moving this, prying these things apart, I should say, is going to crack this, there's a very easy fix to that as well. All you do is you get a piece of scotch tape, put a piece of scotch tape over it and then put the knob on and that acts as a shim between the two, the sticky side being in, of course, right? And then that acts as a shim and that works very, very well. So it's kind of a little trick when you don't want to break these things. Sometimes those little tricks are, you know, worth their weight in gold, especially if you've ever broken one of these things before. And uh, anybody who's ever tried to pry one of these things apart, I think has probably broken one of them at some point. The aluminum ones are very, very, you got to be s extremely careful with those ones. So all of these wax capacitors are going to be bad. These ones here too, this kind of a ceramic shell, they're all going to be bad. Here's some more of these solar sealed tight capacitors. They're sealed tight keep the leakage in. So all of these have got to go. It's a mixture of the old roundy style resistors and the newer Allen Bradley, the ones with the squared off ends. So there has been quite a few hands inside this thing. So where would I start? Well, first of all, the very first thing that I would do is uh, take this line cord right here, just like so, and uh, just do this like that. And that'll go in the garbage, like so. And this will get a brand new line cord. And I may as well take this off here as well. Just get this thing from hanging. It'd be interesting to see what's under here. Let's see what's under this black tape. What did they use? Whoa! <laughs> 220 microfarad at 160 volts. This capacitor is known as the cathode bonding wire remover. So, yeah, way out of spec. I'll explain more about that in a while. Uh, 220 at 160 is uh, way over the top for these things. So I'll explain, I'll keep this off to the side here so I can tell you what I mean here in just a little bit and I'll explain why putting a capacitor like this in this radio is uh, very harmful to the rectifier tube. You can see the, the factory values, right, are 50 and 30, okay? So we can see here 50 microfarad is the red wire, and then 30 microfarad is the blue wire. And that's the maximum amount of filtering. So if you were to put those two in parallel, you'd get about 80 microfarad maximum. All in one capacitor, this is 220 not a good thing. So whoever installed that obviously didn't know about what happens to the uh, cathode bonding wire in the rectifier tube. So the next thing to do is just to go through and test most of all of these resistors. It's a real mix of just different types of resistors. There's a real thin bodied 470k resistor right here. Roundy, very thin bodied, much thinner than this one here. These are roundies right here, and then there's a standard Allen Bradley. Now you'll notice on these ones here that there is no fourth band, which means that these are 20% tolerance resistors. So it can be within 20% of this rating here, and this is 3.3 meg. So 3, 3, and then 5. 5 is 5 zeros. Okay, so 3, 3, and 5 zeros is 3.3 million. So... Yeah, there we go. That'll be 3.3 meg, 10 meg over here, 
150 ohms here, 330k here, 470k here, 22k here, 22k here, and this one here looks like the other band is gone off of this one, maybe 220 ohms, most likely on the schematic. We'll check this out here in just a little bit. See if that's what that is. There's only two bands here. Probably brown being the third band, so 220 ohms, I would imagine. All right, I'll get some test equipment into the shot here, and let's go through and test some of these resistors. Okay, let's test some resistors. Let's start with this one that looks like it's missing a band, either on one end or the other. Let's find out what this one is. 1.8, so that does not add up to anything here. So that looks like there might be a brown band right at the beginning. If there is, that would be 1.2k ohm. And that may have moved up to 1.8. Now, since there is no other band on this, this would be 20% tolerance. So I'd end up replacing that anyways. So, yeah, we'll have to look into that one here in just a little bit. Let's take a look at this 3.3 meg resistor here. I can get a good connection on that. About 4.7 meg. Now you're probably saying to yourself, well, you're testing these resistors in circuit. Is that not going to affect the reading? Only in some cases it will. In a lot of these older vacuum tube radios, they're in circuits that are, they're, well, they're in high impedance circuitry. Usually these things are attached in areas that the other end doesn't lead through other components. In a lot of solid state devices, there are many other components in the way, and there's other things that will really confuse meters. So in this old vacuum tube circuitry, a lot of the times you can just test resistors in circuit and read them in there. Now, most of the time they read low, not high, if there's something that's across it. And as you can see, this is reading high, so that would mean that this resistor has moved high. So 4.8 meg, that's way out of there. That needs to go. So here's a 22K ohm resistor. Let's see what this one measures. 26. See what this one measures. There's another 22K ohm resistor. See what this one measures. Oh, 22.3, that one's not bad. Here's a 470. With a huge glob of solder running down the side here. Look at that, just a big blob of solder there. That's not too bad. 470 to just about 500K. So there's a decimal place there, 0.4995 mega ohms. So that's just about 500K. Still, you know, it's way off. So here's a 330K ohm resistor. Let's see what this one's at. 325. That one's pretty good. This is a newer Allen Bradley resistor, so I kind of imagine that. Look at this one has been twisted into place here. They've actually taken that and twisted the leads together onto something old and then ran some solder up that. Wow, this is some pretty scary workmanship in this thing. Look at that. Let's twist it up right here. Why not just desolder that? Look at look at the size of the blob of solder here. This is how they're supposed to look, right? Here's the the lug on the tube socket. comes out of this little opening here. And then this is the actual thing that crimps the pin of the tube. So you can see how far away that is. Look at this thing. This huge blob of solder run down in here, over here. So just crazy stuff. Maybe if I move this. Well, I don't want to move this on an angle, so then everything is going to end up moving away. So... All right, let's continue testing stuff here. So this is 150 ohms it's supposed to be. 146, it's not bad. 10 meg, this one. Let's see what this one is. 9.6, 9.7. So there's obviously a capacitor in here. That's not bad. Very close to 10 meg. 
Let's see. Yeah, just just some scary stuff. Go across this capacitor here. Interesting, always interesting to see if these things are just dead shorted. Let's see if this thing is dead shorted. Probably not. Let's just find out. No. Still pretty low though. Wow. Lots of work to be done here. So, what is my first angle? Well, the first thing that I want to do is clean this thing up. There's solder blobs and everything just all over the place in here. The wiring is just, just atrocious. Uh, the resistors are most likely all going to get changed just because you know, there's not many of them in here. You know, you can almost count them on one hand. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe. You know, so there's not, not a whole lot. There might be one hiding somewhere that I'm not seeing, but you know, it's just almost on one hand. You know, a lot of the times, the, the newer versions, they had uh, a smaller hybrid like looking module. They were known as couplets. And a lot of resistors hid in those things. They just had a whole bunch of leads on the bottom, like a modern day device that would just go to all sorts of different places, kind of like an IC. I've shown this in some of my earlier videos. They are, they technically are an early integrated type circuit, just with capacitors and resistors inside. But these ones here, this is old enough that they're all still, you know, separate on the outside. So I'll get rid of all of these things, and then after that's done, I'll clean it up and replace all the capacitors, put a new line cord in, I'll put a polarized line cord on here, and all that kind of stuff. So what I'll do is, once I have all the resistors and everything all cleaned up in here, I'll start explaining a lot about adding a polarized line cord to one of these things, and some of the safety things that really need to be known about working on All-American 5 radios. There's no transformers in these things. So in order to work on this thing, you should have a separate transformer, which is known as an isolation transformer. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I get a lot of this stuff cleaned up and we're a little bit closer to uh, getting this thing running. Wow. Since the underside of this chassis is just in such an incredible mess, what I'm going to do is start desoldering some wires. I think I'll remove this audio transformer. This is some form of a, what looks to be a universal replacement. So whether this is even installed correctly is beyond me. This is a really good example of why you do not plug one of these radios into the wall to test it out. If you find one of these things at a thrift store or a secondhand store or online, wherever you purchase one of these things, there is a really good chance that the bottom portion of the radio that you purchase will look something like this. You got to remember this thing is from the 40s and this has been through many, many technicians' hands and they end up looking like this and really like this is, um, you know, it needs to be cleaned up. Now, one of the things that happens when people plug these things into the wall right away when they get them is they burn tubes out. So if this filter capacitor here is bad, it'll affect a lot of things. Sometimes, depending on the way that the, the audio output transformer is wired in, they have a tap off the audio output transformer that feeds the high voltage to other portions of the circuitry. You'll burn that tap out, and there's a good possibility that that's what's happened here. That's why this has a replacement transformer and why they've cut one lead off of this filter capacitor things like that. So they, the radio itself tells a bit of a story just by the way that it sits. Now, when you plug one of these things in and just say nothing has been done to it, it burns out tubes. It'll, again, blow that cathode bonding wire off of the rectifier tube, and then immediately you have to go purchase another tube. So I'm hoping that the, you know, the tubes in this thing are okay, and we'll look at that here in just a little bit as well. So always, you know, be very, very careful. These things really need to be serviced before they're ever plugged in because, you know, you end up with this kind of stuff all the time. And I've come across stuff that's quite a bit worse than this as well. So this by no means is the worst I've ever seen, but it's, um, this, it definitely ranks up there somewhere. So what I'll do is I'll start removing this. So what I'll do is I'll just start desoldering some of the wires here. So they look like they're pretty loosely tacked on here. So there's a huge blob of solder on here, so I'll have to melt some of that. 
So that wire is undone. Let's take a look at this one right over here. There's another huge blob of solder on this one hanging out down at the bottom here. And again, this is, uh, again, really common. A lot of, uh, you know, tinkerers could have gotten in here and experimented with this and stuff over time. Again, you know, they, these things, they tell quite a story. You know, just over time, they've been, you know, in through so many people's hands, right? This lug here is pretty loose as well. They're usually not that loose, so there might actually be something broken under there. If there is, I'll put a different type of standoff in here to support the wires later on. Again, I'm not too worried about these wires right now. I'll figure this all out in just a little bit. As you can see, everything's just tacked on. Things are just falling off. Huge blob of solder down here. Look at this huge molten ball of solder. So what I'll do is I'll get my vacuum tool in here. I have a, a vacuum desoldering tool and I'll just get that out of there. And it sounds like it's actually plugged my soldering tool. I can see stuff starting to poke out of there. Let's see if it is plugged. That was a lot of solder that this thing inhaled. Yeah, I think that's just, uh, I think that's my issue, not the actual solder, because I haven't cleaned out this capsule here in just a little while, so I'll probably have to clean that out. So there's one, got rid of all of that solder. Look at how much that took out of there. And I think this thing is full. So let's see. Yeah, look at that. It's pretty full. So I need to go about cleaning this out. Put that into my little bin here in just a moment. Still a little bit of room in there. When I poked the little cleaning tool in there, it moved some of it out of the way. So I can vacuum up another huge solder blob. Look at this. Look at the size of that solder blob. They're all over the place. This one here will probably do it in. Get that one out of the way. Just things like that, I'm going to have to go through and clean all this kind of stuff up. You know, this is a... Well, what a mess. Okay, so back to this. So there's these wires here, out of the way. And there's multiple taps on this. I'll read the uh, legend on the top here and explain what the legend is. This is common for replacement audio transformers. This will help you figure out how to replace an audio transformer like this in one of your units. Many of these things come universal now, so you can put them into many different applications. On this side here, it looks like somebody just tied up the speaker leads onto the old ones. So this looks like the old speaker leads, and they've just kind of twisted what's left over together here. Look at this mess. So I'm not even going to bother desoldering these things. What I'm going to do is just clip them out like so. And I'll get in here with my screwdriver and just remove this transformer. It shouldn't be too hard because one of the screws isn't even in there. Look at that. It's just barely in there. So I get this thing out of the way. Get that out of here. And I can even test this here in just a little bit. So the legend is really nice on this. And again, I'll explain a little bit about this here in just a little bit. Looks like a nice little audio transformer. So just getting that thing out of the way cleans things up. Big solder blobs on the chassis. Probably end up heating those things up with my soldering gun. In order to heat things up like this on a chassis, these are it takes a lot of heat to do this. And I have a video that takes a, a Weller soldering gun. It's this one actually right here. It's sitting off to the side. And you put a copper tip on it like so. And that creates heat, a lot of heat really fast. And that allows you to melt these solder blobs here and get them off the chassis to clean things up as well. At this point, I've replaced all the resistors and all the capacitors on this side of the chassis with brand new components. Before I installed each component, I tested every single individual part to make sure that it's as close to its value as possible. Again, we want to see how this radio receiver performed when it rolled off the factory production line back in the 1940s. So by doing this, it's just going to get us that much closer to that type of performance. 
Before I reinstall all the vacuum tubes, I'm going to test each one for emission. If any of the vacuum tubes are weak, I will replace them with a brand new device. The last thing that we would want at this point is something as simple as a vacuum tube hampering the performance of this radio receiver. You'll notice on this side of the chassis I really haven't done anything to the wiring at this point, and that's because there's a couple of topics that I really need to cover, and one of them involves safety around All-American 5 and All-American 6 receivers. So this is the All-American 5 version. So first of all, the line cord that was issued with this radio receiver is not polarized, so you can plug it into the wall anyway. So this is the factory plug, and you'll notice that both of the spades are the same size, so you can plug it into the wall this way, or you can plug it into the wall this way. And that gives us a 50-50 chance of bringing the chassis of this radio receiver close to the hot side, and that isn't a safe thing. We need to make sure that the chassis of the radio receiver is firmly fixed to the neutral side of the line cord. Now, when the line cord is replaced on this radio receiver, it will be replaced with a polarized line cord. So one of the spades will be larger on the plug than the other. So we'll only plug into the wall one way. We can't reverse it. Usually the larger spade is the neutral side, and that neutral side needs to be as close to this chassis as possible. Now, in a lot of these radio receivers, they put the switch in the opposite side. So we need to move this switch over to the other side. So these radio receivers do not have a transformer in them. This is a transformerless set, which means that this can run off of 115 volts AC or DC. So if you had a whole bunch of storage batteries and you put them in series, you could run this radio off of just a pure DC source. Now, if we look at this, we need to keep the neutral line as close to the chassis as possible, and that means that this side needs to be neutral. This is a ground symbol, and this is a chassis symbol, so that rake-looking symbol there means the metal case of this radio receiver. This here, this wire, and this portion of the potentiometer, all of this, this is all this ground symbol right here. So a whole bunch of grounds are interconnecting through here. They tie at this point right here. And then this is the chassis. Now you'll notice between the ground symbol and the chassis symbol, we have a 0 0.05 microfarad capacitor rated at 200 volts and a 220K bleeder resistor across that capacitor. So that's in parallel with that cap. That's this capacitor right here and hiding just below this other one here is that resistor. Okay, 220K. This capacitor here is often referred to as the death capacitor. That's some pretty strong words for a capacitor. But what happens with these capacitors is they often short. So if this capacitor shorts and becomes a jumper, it's going to connect this here, this side, to the chassis. So if it did connect this side to the chassis, and we still had the non-polarized line cord on here and we had it plugged in, remember we have that 50-50 chance with the, other, with the other line cord, right? That would make the chassis of this attached directly to the hot side, which is extremely dangerous. So we need to eliminate that chance. So by putting a polarized line cord on here, we have to move this switch over to the hot line. So the neutral line is always firmly affixed to the ground over here. And then of course we have the capacitor running across here to this. We have to replace this with the appropriate safety cap too. I'll talk about that in a moment. So I need to move the switch over. So that means that what I'm gonna have to do is remove these wires off of here. Now there are a bunch of grounds here. There's a ground running from here over to the heaters. And then there's a jumper lead right here. So I don't know if you can see that. We'll just get this closer into the shot here and I'll zoom on in. So you can see right here, there's a jumper that runs from the bottom portion of this switch down here, right down here, up to here. So basically this ground and this ground are tied together right where you know the line comes in as it's switched right here. Now, the reason that they have two lines and they just didn't run it up to here and then run this over to the other side here and then just bridge this over to this side, the reason that we have two grounds is because one of them carries a lot of current. And if we were to have the current going through this one here, you'll see that this is on the potentiometer right here, right? So 
See that potentiometer right here? It's on here. If we were to feed the current through this line right here, what would happen is we would get a lot of hum in the audio because this is attached right to the ground side of this resistor, which ties to the grid of this vacuum tube, and that's a very sensitive part of the tube. So they need to run two separate grounds, one that runs to the filament because there's going to be current on this line, and this line here really doesn't have any current on it, and that's just going to keep that free of hum. So something to keep in mind if you're ever replacing or, you know, modifying a chassis like this, you want to make sure if you see two grounds to definitely keep them separate and keep it as close to the, you know, tying to, say, the neutral as possible. But again, we have to get this out of the switch line because we need to use this switch now for the hot side. Okay, so the way that I'm going to fix this problem here is I'm going to install a standoff right here on the chassis. Now, I have to be careful in this chassis because you can see there's a cutout here and there's a piece of the case, like the actual case of the radio, an extrusion that runs through here and then the screw goes through a hole on the back side of the chassis here. So through here, there's going to be an extrusion like this so I need to make sure that the standoff isn't in the way of that extrusion so it'll be closer to the potentiometer the neutral line will run over to that standoff I'll run a line from here down to the neutral I'll replace this wire here because it's going to be too short I'll run it over here to that neutral as well and then I'll completely remove this from the switch so I'll remove this one little neutral jumper that runs through here get this out of the way I'll run the remove this neutral jumper and that'll free up the switch I'll also remove this resistor off here as well so that these two terminals are completely clean then what I'll do is I'll run the hot line up to here and then the hot line from the bottom portion of the switch will run back to here and to this point right here and that'll make this a lot safer now this capacitor here needs to be replaced so this one here this one here is known as that death cap. This capacitor has to be replaced with the appropriate safety capacitor. I'm going to replace this capacitor with an X1 Y2 rated capacitor, which is like this one right here. These have all sorts of safety features built right into these things. So these are designed not to fail in a short condition. Okay. So these are the modern replacement for this cap. This always has to be addressed in every single radio receiver like this because chances are it's going to have a waxy like this and these things are in some form of decay or disrepair and if this thing shorts it's you know and you have that say you had a non-polarized line cord on this it would make this thing all that much more dangerous. I'm also going to test the audio transformer as well because this is a replacement audio transformer and there's something that really isn't talked about these audio transformers here you'll see how we have a tap that's on this audio transformer that's on the other side of where the B plus goes in so you see how we have the B plus running to this tap but then out here we have a tap coming off the transformer and that powers the rest of the radio I'm going to talk a little bit about why they're running this tap off the transformer to the rest of the radio here in just a moment when we test the transformer as well. Since this radio receiver has been so heavily tampered with over time, we should really test the replacement audio output transformer as well. So somewhere down the line, the original audio transformer had burnt out and this was the replacement. So before I go about reinstalling this whole thing and connecting up all the wiring, I want to make sure that this thing is okay. So I'll show you how I do that. And I'll also show you a few things that catch a few technicians as well. I'll also explain a little bit about this transformer topology here. This is a little bit of an odd wiring setup. I'll explain that here in just a moment. So we can see on the transformer here, we have red is B plus and blue is 3000 ohms. We have blue and white, which is a 3% tap. And then we have red and yellow, which is a 6% tap. And then the secondary is 3.2 ohms right here. That would be the secondary. So we don't really have to worry about this. This is the side that usually goes wrong in these little audio output transformers. It's rated at five watts too, not too bad. So it says red B plus and blue is 3000 ohms. So this would be the B plus line right here. So this would be the red line running up to this tap right here. And then the blue tap would run over here to the plate of the 50 L6 tube. 
Now, you see on the transformer here, it says 3,000 ohms. So when we measure this from red to blue, okay, so I'll just touch this to here and to here, you can see it says 185 ohms. It doesn't say 3,000 ohms. Well, why is that? A lot of people would think that, oh, maybe the transformer has shorted turns or something like that, right? This is an impedance rating. This measures DC resistance. So what's happening here is this is an AC resistance measurement. These meters only measure DC resistance. That's why we're seeing that. We need to have a special meter in order to see that 3000 ohms. And I'll show you that here in just a little bit. So don't get caught by that. If you ever see, you know, the, the an impedance rating on a transformer like that and you measure and you find that it's a little bit low measuring with a meter like this, that's quite normal. Again, you're measuring DC resistance. Now, some transformer manufacturers are nice enough to actually put the DC resistance resistance rating right on the transformer as well. These guys, they didn't do that. They just put 3000 ohms here. Now you can see here, it says blue to white is a 3% tap. And then it says here, red and yellow is a 6% tap. Now what we don't know about is whether these taps are on this side of the B plus or whether they're on this side here. Now you can see in this transformer topology, it's kind of a little bit odd. You see we have the B plus line running into this tap up here and then we have a winding further out that runs out and they power the rest of the radio off of that winding. There's even a 20 microfarad capacitor there. Well, why are they doing that? Some people might think, well, there's some form of feedback or something like that. Not at all. The reason that they're doing this is to eliminate hum. So this is a hum reduction technique that they used to use way back when. So some radios had humbucking coils on the actual speaker itself or on the speaker side. All right. But this is just another hum reduction topology just to get rid of hum. So what we want to do is we want to find whether this transformer is a very good replacement, whether they actually researched this and found a transformer with the taps on this side, or whether they've put taps on the other side as well and where along the winding these taps are. So we can very easily do that with just a DC resistance reading. So we know that from the red line here, this would be the red line to the blue line, we had 185 ohms, right? So it's 185 ohms from here to here. So if this tap, so if say the blue and white tap was on this side, from this portion of the winding, it would be lower. So it might be 180 or 170 ohms from this portion from the blue wire. If it's 190 ohms, maybe 200 ohms, it's going to be on the other side of the red wire. So let me give you an example here, okay? So we know already that we have 185 ohms or something like that, okay? 185 ohms from here to here. So I want to measure from here to the blue and white tap because that's 3%. So that's going to be, you know, the first one that we're going to try. So we had 185 ohms from here to here. So let's test to this one here. 192. It's further away than this tap. So we know that we're going this way. So this output transformer actually has this winding inside it. And then this is a 6% tap. So this here should be really high. This one should be really far away from the B plus side here. Yeah, look at that, 198. So technically, these two should be very close together. These should be, you know, in the low ohms apart from each other. And there they are, 6.8 ohms. So this is 6.8 ohms this way on the winding. And then the other tap was, let's see, how many ohms would that be away from the red B plus lead? 12.9, so 13 ohms away. So we have two taps. We have a tap that's this one here. We could call that, you know, the this wire here, or we could call it this wire here. Now, I don't know how many ohms the actual resistance is, the DC resistance is from the B plus line on the original transformer, because that kind of stuff just isn't talked about. Now, here's the thing. I'll get this out of the way. 
These transformers can very easily be replaced with just a standard four wire type audio output transformer. So we have the primary side, we'll have a red and blue wire on the primary side and then whatever colors they choose for the secondary side would be absolutely fine. The reason that we can use just a standard two wire type transformer, two wire primary type transformer nowadays is because we have much better capacitors and finding values higher than 40 microfarad and 20 are very, very common nowadays. And you know, if one was worried about damaging the cathode on the vacuum tube, so if you're worried about, you know, the cathode bonding wire in the vacuum tube, you could very easily put a dropping resistor to the rest of the radio receiver and then just put another capacitor there and you'd eliminate hum that way. So way back when, when these radio receivers were put out, capacitors with you know, high microfarad values weren't really all that incredibly common. And the factory filter capacitors were very expensive back in the day. So, you know, the factory capacitors and the audio output transformers were two very expensive components in this radio receiver. Nowadays, capacitors, you know, are incredibly well, they're cheap nowadays, and you can get extremely high quality capacitors for very reasonable prices. So there are lots of ways around this. But it is nice to know that this transformer here has these taps on this side. So what I'll do is I'll try the, the, the blue and white tap here, and then I'll try the, the red and yellow tap here, and I'll see which one works better with the receiver. I imagine I'll probably end up just using the one closest to this as I'm, you know, putting better capacitors in here as well. So now what we want to do is we want to actually see whether this transformer is what it says it is. We want to see whether it's 3000 ohms. So I'll hook this up to a different meter and we'll check out the actual impedance of this transformer and I'll show you how not having a load on a transformer really affects the impedance on the primary side. Let's test the impedance of this audio output transformer using the Genrad 1689M. So what I want to do is I want to attach the blue and red leads. So we can see the red is the B plus and the blue runs to the plate of the vacuum tube. So these are the leads of interest to get 3000 ohms. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll attach that up right now. Blue lead attached and red lead attached. So you can see we have 9.1k ohms when we're supposed to have 3000 ohms. Why is that? Well, we don't have any load attached to the secondary. So what I'll do is I'll attach a 3.3 ohm resistor up just because I have one handy. So for 3.2 ohms, we should roughly get 3000 ohms on the primary. Okay, so I'll just attach that right now. Okay, so one side is attached and the other side is attached. And look at that. We now have 3K ohms with the appropriate load attached. So there's a 3.3 ohm resistor. across the second area of this transformer. Now watch what happens if I remove one jumper clip. You can see how the impedance goes high. And that's why it's so incredibly important in a vacuum tube audio amplifier and even some solid state amplifiers that have transformers to have a load attached to them if there's any type of amplitude happening. So, usually for testing purposes with tube audio amplifiers, you know, if you keep the output very, very low, it's usually okay to run them without a load. But once you start turning that volume control up, or once you start turning your signal generator amplitude up, you definitely need a load or you'll damage your audio amplifier. I have this portion of the chassis all cleaned out and I'm ready to start rebuilding in this section. I've also installed this little standoff over here for the neutral wire. So that's all ready to go. But before I start rebuilding that section and putting a line cord on this, I would like to clean the chassis up first on the upper side. So 
When you're cleaning things up and you have a line cord dangling around, it's kind of a pain. It's nice to have this thing kind of stand alone right now so there's nothing really hanging off this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to desolder these two wires here and I'll desolder these two wires and that'll allow me to remove the back. While this is off, I'll clean this up and replace this capacitor here as well. I'll replace this capacitor with a safety capacitor, one of those disc style capacitors. Over here, I've disconnected the speaker leads and I've also removed the dial lamp. So I'm gonna remove the speaker, that's very easy. There's only two screws on the bottom side of the chassis. So with the speaker removed, the dial lamp removed, and the back side removed, it'll allow me to get to the chassis all that much easier without me bumping into things. I'm going to have to use an aggressive chemical to get this overspray off, and I really don't want to be taking that aggressive chemical and rubbing against these wires because there's a varnish on these wires. So I'm going to most likely be using lacquer thinner to take this off. So I'll use a a rag and some lacquer thinner, and this will be done outdoors, so lots of ventilation. So if you're ever going to use a chemical like lacquer thinner, you need to read the safety precautions because that stuff is pretty toxic. you got to be very, very careful with that. And the fumes are very bad as well. So things to keep in mind if you're going to use an aggressive chemical like that. So what I'm going to do now, again, is just remove the speaker, remove the back. I'll get the entire top side of the chassis cleaned up, and then I'll start rebuilding the bottom. You'll also notice that the tuning capacitor here is on a bit of an angle and that's just because the tension of the dial string over time because of this spring here has kind of pulled this whole mechanism, the tuning capacitor and this bracket over a little bit. So basically it's kind of you know, put a little bit of pressure on the rubber grommets on the bottom. Now here's the thing, the rubber grommets are still fine. They're in really nice condition and they're nice and soft still. This rubber is extremely soft, pretty much like the day it came up from the factory that is you know really soft so no problems with that whatsoever one thing to always make sure if you're going to leave the original rubber grommets in if you suspect that they're okay is you want to make sure that there is a space between this bracket and this chassis these are two separate grounds this is chassis ground and this bracket is rf ground they cannot touch each other at this point and that's the reason that there's these rubber grommets holding this assembly away from the chassis so something to always keep in mind if you're ever working on a receiver and you don't replace these grommets and this bracket touches the chassis, it'll create all sorts of problems in the oscillator section, things like that. The chassis cleaned up very nicely. All the overspray is now gone. Get rid of that thick layer of dust and all the grease and debris and everything. So before this is all finished, I'll put a spot of oil in here. A little spot of oil right down in there so let's grab something to point with here put a little spot of oil right down in there and i'll put some oil in this front bearing you can see all the little balls in the ball bearing there I'll put some oil in there as well and then on the face of the unit i'll also put some oil in here put some oil in here i'll put some oil right down in here because this the tuning shaft right here goes into that little bushing. Put some oil right there, and I'll also put just a little drop of oil right there. Just to make sure everything moves nice and smooth. This cleaned up very nice as well. You can see there's just some grease on there from me moving this thing around. This cleaned up very well, and the glass cleaned up too. Now I tried in a very inconspicuous area, and I just used water. I used nothing else. And where the little lines were in that felt that protects the glass with the clips. I tried some water in that area and the paint on the back side of that dial is really tough, so there's no problems there. So I put some on an actual shop towel, Let's see if I have one of them here, one of those blue shop towels at any rate, but just put some water on it. And I very carefully worked at the back side of the glass and that turned out very, very nice. So we'll take a look at that here when we do the alignment after this is all reassembled. The underside of the chassis is now complete, so pretty much at this point I could test the tubes, put the tubes in and try it out. It's that close. Audio transformers reinstalled. I tapped the chassis to 632 and used some nice stainless 632 screws to hold the transformer in. Terminal tie strip over here is installed with the two new filter capacitors. Safety capacitor is mounted here with the 220k ohm resistor there. That all worked out very well. The new line cord is installed. You can see there's a protective coating over the line cord where it goes under the cable restraint. And then the cable comes over here, 
runs over to here. So this is the neutral connection and this is the hot connection through the switch and back over here to this tube socket. You can see that right there. So everything worked out very well. I've also attached one of the speaker output leads right to the chassis. So you can see this little wire here from the audio output transformer secondary runs right to ground on the chassis and I'm running this lead here up to the top side. The reason I can do that is the factory speaker here has one of the connections grounded right to the shell of the speaker and this is tied to the chassis so I don't need to run two wires up here to the speaker. That's the reason they do that so you can cut down on wiring and which is kind of nice because this little hole in the chassis down here is kind of tight with all of these wires in it so it worked out really nice eliminating one wire so the only wire running up here is the hot lead for the speaker. Worked out very well. New safety capacitor installed for the external antenna connection. Everything is cleaned up. I haven't lubricated anything yet. I'll end up doing that. So really, all I need to do now is test the tubes, populate this with tubes, and it's ready for an alignment. Let's test the 50L6 vacuum tube first. As you can see, the overspray is still on it. I haven't cleaned the tube yet, because if the tube is bad, what's the point, right? So before I plug this tube into the tester, I need to set the tester up. If you ever plug a tube into a vacuum tube tester before making all the adjustments, you can damage the tube or even the tester. So I have this set to 50L6. So this is just a roller chart, so you can roll this and find out where everything is. Lots of tubes on here. So I have A, B, C, and D here, so I need to set A to 1. So this is A up here, so I have to set that to the number 1. It says B, you set to 14, pointing to 14 right here. C points to number 4. C, number 4. And then D is number 2, so this is D here. I have to move the lever up, number 2 to D here. Now I can plug the tube in. What I have to do first after the tube is plugged in and warmed up is readjust the line. You'll see this will move off of the little line adjustment when I plug the tube in because the tube loads the circuit. See that? And as it warms up it'll creep back up and then once the tube is warmed up and it's into emission, then I'll readjust the line here. Then what I want to do is move every one of these levers to the F position first. If this neon bulb stays on, it, the tube has a short, it's just going to be discarded. But if it flashes, that's absolutely fine. So all of these levers, with the exception of number 7, number 7 will shut the filament off. You can see here number 7. I'll demonstrate that here in just a moment. So I'll move this up to the little arrow. Right about there. So I'm going to move every lever just to the F position and back again. And we should see this flicker. If it stays on, the tube gets discarded. That means that there's an internal short somewhere. You can see the filament going out on the vacuum tube. That's number seven. So no problems there. So the next step is to put F to 3, 4, and 5. So this is F right here, so I'll have to go 3, 4, and 5. Now I'm ready to test the tube. I'll just readjust the line, make sure it's spot on that little arrow. Right there. And here we go. No problems. It's in the good area. No problems whatsoever. The 50L6 is good. Now, all the rest of the tubes in the radio, I have to do this to. And some of these tubes have three sections inside them. So that's three complete separate tests and moving all of these levers. So it is pretty time consuming. So I'll do that off of camera. And if there's any weak tubes, I'll replace them and get them all installed so we can do an alignment. I've tested all the tubes in this radio receiver and there was only one weak tube and that's the 12 SQ7. This tube plugs into this socket right here. So I've replaced this tube with the one that you see right here. This is an audio amplifier and a detector. 
So if this tube is weak, that would affect the way this radio detects and amplifies the signal. So we definitely wouldn't want that. At this point, I'm ready to try out the radio receiver and see if it comes to life. Now, if you're following along and you're repairing a radio receiver like this, you're definitely doing so at your own risk. You need an isolation transformer whenever you're working on anything like this, and it's extremely important to have an isolation transformer, especially with test gear attaching to the chassis and things like that as well. So the isolation transformer I have is current limited, and it also has a variac on it, so I can bring the current up and bring the voltage up here slowly. So be very, very careful if you're working on any type of an All-American 5 or All-American 6 transformerless receiver. If you haven't heard of what an isolation transformer is, I strongly suggest that you look into it. Okay, I'm going to turn this thing on and I'll bring it up slow. So I want to turn my Variac right down. Turn on the supply. Turn it to about 30 volts or so. And... I'll turn this on. So now, normally when you turn an All-American 5 or All-American 6 radio receiver on, the dial lamp will get bright and then go down. That's absolutely normal. This light is powered off of a tap on the filament of this 35Z5 rectifier. So here we go. So that's normal and that is a good sign. So I'll just let everything come up nice and slow here. You see the cathodes are glowing in some of the tubes. Okay, I'll bring it up just a little bit more, bring it up to about 75 volts. And at this point, I should probably start to hear some noise in the speaker if everything is working okay. Very faintly at any rate. Turn this up. And it's coming to life. That's a good sign. So I'll turn this down. I'll bring this up to full line voltage here. That's up to full line right there. Give it a bit of volume. Now there's no alignment, no RF alignment, no IF alignment, no anything. So let's just see how this receives. I'll just quickly coast through the band here. Not bad. So it's definitely alive. It's definitely working. So the next step is to do an IF alignment, and that's aligning the little adjustments inside this can here, and then after that's done, I'll end up doing an RF alignment. So that means that I have to put the dial glass back on, and I'll have to line up the pointer first of all, because I'm not sure if this is even on each side. Let's see. Eh, it might be pretty close. We'll find out. If it's off, the needle here has some form of tape that they've stuck on the string and that's going to be very difficult to move so I might just loosen up these set screws right here and allow this just to slip on that shaft there and I can adjust it that way as well. So in a way that's kind of cheating, I don't have to move the, the needle on the string here, which is kind of nice. So this has been stuck in this piece of tape here for who knows how many years and that would uh, be very difficult to get that moving on the string. I'm now ready to perform an IF alignment on this small radio receiver using this vacuum tube voltmeter as an indicator and a signal generator that's feeding a signal into the IF chain so I can adjust both of these IF transformers successfully. 
Now, before any alignment is begun on a small radio receiver like this, especially anything with vacuum tubes in it, it's a really good idea to let the receiver or device under test warm up for about 15 minutes or so. That's a good number for an All-American 5 or All-American 6 receiver. Now that'll depend on the type of receiver that's being aligned. Some receivers in the actual alignment instructions call for 45 minutes to over an hour of warm-up time to let everything stabilize. It's also a good idea if you're using a vacuum tube voltmeter to let it warm up and stabilize as well because it has vacuum tubes in it. So I'll explain exactly what I'm doing here. In the top of both of these IF transformers, there's two adjustments. There's two capacitors in each IF transformer, and I have to tune them all for a peak signal. I want to get the maximum amount of signal going through the IF chain. So from my signal generator, going through the IF chain, and I'm going to be reading that signal at the speaker, because as I tune this and more signal gets through, it's just going to get louder, and this will give me a visual indication of that. So what's happening here is I have just enough signal from my signal generator going into the radio receiver here just to put a little bit of a tone there. I don't want to overload the front end or cause any AVC action to happen. I just want just enough signal there so when I peak things up, it'll get louder and louder and louder. And then once it gets loud enough or too loud, I'll turn the signal generator back down again and re-peak everything in order to get the maximum sensitivity out of the IF chain in this radio receiver. So there's a 455 kilohertz signal going into this little device and going to this red alligator clip right here. And there's a 1000 cycle tone on that signal modulated to 50%. So that 1000 cycle tone is what we'll be hearing in that speaker. Now, a lot of the times, if it gets too loud, what I'll do is I'll disconnect the speaker and actually put a dummy load in there. So I'll, I'll use, a, say, a 3.3 ohm resistor like we used to test the audio transformer. That way I don't have to listen to it while I'm aligning it. But I'm going to let the tone happen just so that you can hear and see what's going on to give you a better idea of what, what's actually happening in this alignment procedure. So that red alligator clip right there is attached to pin number 5 of this 12SA7. That's the control grid of the mixer tube right here. Okay, so that red alligator is just clipped right here and then the black lead here, which is just common, is clipped to the chassis. The common lead of my vacuum tube voltmeter is also clipped to the chassis, and I'm going to clip this alligator clip, which is attached to the probe, right to the speaker. All right, so it's just going to be looking at the, the actual speaker. That's what we're going to be looking at right here. Now, here's another thing to always keep in mind whenever you're aligning a receiver like this. This thing right here is attached to an isolation transformer and a current limited variac supply, and that's absolutely crucial when any work or any servicing is done on a receiver like this. So again, if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Be very, very careful. If you, if you didn't use an isolation transformer, extremely bad things would happen. What usually ends up happening is you blow the lead off the test clips, things like that. It's very, very dangerous. So depending on the application, an isolation transformer, especially for this, is a necessary, definitely a necessary thing to have. All right, so you can hear a tone. So I have my signal generator putting out just enough signal to get a tone in there. I have to attach this up to the speaker now so that I can get a reading. And I'm gonna take my insulated screwdriver and adjust these trimmer capacitors inside this IF transformer. Now, one other thing that I should mention, and I've mentioned this before in other videos, is inside these IF transformers, just gonna put the schematic off to the side here. Inside these IF transformers, those two capacitors in many different types of radio receivers are attached to the high voltage. They've actually attached those caps to the high voltage supply. So if you go in there with a non-insulated screwdriver, this one is double insulated. It's plastic and I've insulated it again with tape just to be safe. So if you were to go in there with a regular screwdriver and if you touch the, the top of the trimmer capacitor and you touch the case of this IF transformer, you short out the power supply and a lot of the times you damage things. So that fools a lot of techs and that causes a lot of problems with IF transformers as well. So something to always keep in mind whenever you're aligning anything with IF transformers in recessed trimmer capacitors. Much of the time those recessed capacitors are attached directly to high voltage in the radio. So there's a, a little tip, a very important tip. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to work my way through these capacitors and I'm going to be looking for a peak. 
Okay, so I'll turn this up until I get just a bit of a tone. Okay, and I'll go into this one first. And I'll give this a bit of a twist. Now you can see that I gained some sensitivity there, right? So what I'll do is I'll just put this up here like so. I'll use this to st sturdy the chassis. So you can see how much that came up. So I'll go down to the next one here. So you can see this is way out of alignment. Again, we're just using this meter to peak. Doesn't matter where the needle sits, as long as we're getting a peak. If you pass it, just go back and do it again. There it is. I'll go over to this one here. Steady this over here. Look at that. These uh, set screws are very, very stiff. So I have to turn that down now. You can see how loud that is. So now I'm going to turn the amplitude of the signal generator way down. Okay, so I've turned that way down again. So I can turn this up just a little bit. Again, a lot of the times I would do this with a, an actual dummy load so I wouldn't have to listen to this, but this gives you an idea of how much this is coming up with that actual sound. So I'll go over to this one here. So you can see they're all way out of adjustment. So I'll go back up to this one here again. And I'll go back to the front one here again. Again, I'm just looking for a peak. That's all I'm doing. And you get the idea. So I'll just go back and forth. I'll reduce the signal on the signal generator one more time. And I'll just go through here and align that. This thing is going to be a, a, a lot more sensitive than it was when we first tried this thing out just a few moments ago. So these IF transformers were way out of alignment. The radio is off and I'm going to reinstall the dial glass. And this is actually very easy to put back on. So I just want to make sure that there are no fingerprints on this. So I'll just wipe off the bottom portion here it's looking pretty good I don't see any fingerprints on that so now this goes on with just clips so there's a piece of felt that protects the glass from being damaged it's a piece of felt that goes on this side so I'll just pinch that felt here like this and I'll grab the felt from the other side and that goes on here like this now the person that had put the dial glass in the last time didn't put the felt in straight so the felt has been on here for a long time crooked and now it's taken that form so this little clip here has a little bit of a bow to one side that goes to the back side so you just press on the little clip just like that and then the same for the other side this one here with a little bow goes towards the back side. I'll just make sure that the felt is nice and even. This is the one that was put on incorrectly. So there it is. I'll just hold that like this. It's wanting to try and do it again. It's just, it's holding that form. I guess who knows how many years it's been in there like that. So hold that. And then I'll just put this on here like this and just give it a bit of a push. And it should just slide on ever so gentle. And that's it. That's it for the dial glass. Now you want to make sure that it's roughly even on each side. It's looking pretty close. And I don't think I would want to force that at all. Now, I'm going to probably go in here with a Q-tip later or something like that. Make sure all the dust is out of here because it's going to accumulate dust throughout this tuning procedure. Now, this 
dial pointer should align up with that last little notch. And when I go over to this side, it should line up with that notch. Now you can see it's over this way and it doesn't go far enough over this way. So I want it to be even. See that? So what I'm going to do here is just let this down for a moment. And I'm going to get the dial light out of the way. Again, the power is removed at this point. Let's get this off of here. Let's put that over there. There's a bunch of set screws down here. I'm going to loosen one of those set screws off. So I'll just take a look over here. So I'll remove or loosen off this one right here, first of all. Just tip that up so I can see that. So I'll loosen this one off like this. And now when I go the other way, I'll also be able to loosen this one off. So this is the one that I'm going to most likely be tightening because I have a clear shot at this screw. So now what I want to do is I want to move that dial pointer. I want to make sure that the capacitor is fully meshed. And I want to move that dial pointer right over onto that line like that. And then now I'll go back here. Let's bend this forward so I can see this. Tighten that one screw up. I won't tighten the other one up yet. I'll just make sure everything's even. So it's right on that line and then that's actually a little bit over. And then this is over this way now. So now what happens with these a lot of the times when you're tightening them, when you tighten the screw, it actually causes the shaft to turn a little bit. So if that happens, you fiddle with it just a little bit more. Make sure that it's all good. Let's make sure that the capacitor is fully ganged. Sometimes this can take a couple of times to get it right. And I think I might have it this time. There it is. Okay. So you can see, if you look at it straight on, okay, it looks like it's off just a little bit there, but look at it straight on. And then over here, it's the same thing. So you can see that was a little bit time consuming. So now what I'm going to do is since there's two set screws, you can see that there's two set screws on here. I'll tighten up the other one that's loose now, and that should lock that in place. And then we can go about starting the oscillator alignment. So that'll be the next thing that we align is we want to make the dial accurate to what it says. So say we're tuned to 600 AM, we want 600 AM to be here, right? So if it's not say 600 AM is here, we need to adjust this little screw up here to make that correct. I believe it's actually adjusted at 1500 on this radio receiver, 1500, I believe right about here or so. I'm now ready to perform an oscillator and antenna alignment on this radio receiver. So that's the adjustment of this capacitor here. This is the oscillator section and this is the antenna section. So by adjusting these two capacitors, it's really the last two steps that need to be done in making this receiver perform the way it's supposed to. So first of all, this here sets the dial tracking. So when I say dial tracking, on this piece of coax here on, in this little box right now, I've got a 1.5 megahertz signal or 1500 kilohertz, however you want to call that, modulated by a 1000 cycle tone at 50% modulation. So there's just a signal sitting here at 1500 kilohertz. So what I'm going to do is lift this radio up and I want to make sure that when this is pointed at 1500, this is 1500 right here. It's right on that little line. So if I move that, you'll see that little line. So that right there is pretty close to 1500. It's a little bit off because of the way the radio is sitting, but it's very close. So I want to make sure that when I turn the volume up, I hear a tone. If I don't hear the tone, I need to search around the band and find where it is to make sure that I'm actually, you know, listening for something that's supposed to be there. So what I'll do is I'll turn the volume up. And I just hear some radio stations, but I don't hear the tone. So what I'm going to do now is rotate this. And there it is. Now you see how that is not right on where it should be. This is the 1500 kilohertz mark right here. So it should be receiving that right about here. So now what I need to do is put the dial pointer right here where it's sitting right now. And I need to turn this little adjustment right here 
until I hear that tone. When I hear that tone right here, I've done my dial alignment. Just that easy. So what I'll do here is, I'll put this in here like so. Turn up the volume, and I'll just give this a twist. Right about there. And that's it for the oscillator alignment. Now, we really don't have any choice if the dial accuracy is off on this radio receiver because that's the only adjustment to adjust the dial tracking. So it's always interesting to see how close it is. So right here is 900 kilohertz. Let's see how close that is. I'll set my signal generator to 900. 900 kilohertz. Okay. I'll just roll down here and see if we can hear it. Hey, look at that. It's right there. So that's looking really, really good. A lot of the times, what really affects this is the Q of the coil changes. So this right here is the oscillator coil, and it's very sensitive to change. So to give you an example of how sensitive this is, all right, so what I'll do is I'll just, I'll prop this up like so, just put a screwdriver under here or something like that, and I'll tune this to that tone. Now watch when I bring my finger close to this coil. It goes right off frequency. So any shift in the way that that coil form has been made, so if the radio has been wet over time, and either that or the coil form has shrunk, or there's, you know, been any type of an issue, the radio's been overheated or left in a really hot attic for many years, sometimes those coils, they deform, and then the, the dial tracking is really hard to get right on spot on but this has been you know kept in a relatively nice looking atmosphere you can see the chassis isn't rusted or anything like that and you know so that's most likely the reason that this lines up so incredibly nice so now back up to 1500 again so i'll just move this over here so the next thing that I need to adjust is this one in the back. That one adjusts the sensitivity of the receiver at 1500. So I'll move this right back onto 1500. So I'll put this back up to 1.5 megahertz. Okay. And I'll tune this. There it is. Now what I'm going to do is adjust this for maximum sensitivity. So I just want this to get as loud as it possibly can. It's like there's something stuck on this here, like a piece of solder or something. Hmm, that's interesting. Oh, it's a piece of fuzz. All right, so here we go. Again. You can hear, ha hear how it's getting nice and quiet now, right? Right there is at maximum sensitivity. And that's it. The alignment is done. The radio receiver is now completely reassembled, so let's see how well this little radio performs after this entire restoration process. So what I'll do is I'll scan through the band and we'll see how many radio stations we can hear on this little radio receiver. So I'll turn up the volume here. They care about the safety of the church. They're not on the edge of the Fun and Motel 6. Start the elimination. 
Just the fourth different kids. They're always playing it. Repair is done today. Stick together. They vote together. Do something about it. So you're shit. The math. But on the old CD that... Hamlin, that's a good name by Adam. Cecil Cooper. Frosty Caramel Coffee for a limited time. He is one of the best I've seen. And a lot of them of a mix of cinnamon coffee. Go cheap. I would say that receives incredibly. There are radio stations all over the band and it sounds really good. So restoration, successful. What a nice little radio receiver this thing is. And now for the answer to the last video's trivia question. I try to include a little bit of electronic trivia in each video. So the question was, what is this device? And in a moment, I'll tell you what it is. So I'll take a quick look at this again. The three leads on the bottom kind of give it away. For those of you that are familiar with this series. Okay, if you want to guess what this is, pause the video now because I'm about to tell you the answer. This is an IN13 indicator tube. And these things are used as spectral displays in equalizers. And people are using these things in newer projects for thermometers and things like that to indicate temperature. All sorts of really neat displays. It kind of looks like a bar graph display when you're using this thing in service. So it's a gas-filled tube, and they have quite the following now. So there's a lot of people building little projects with these tubes right here. So I plan on building something with this down the road. In fact, on Patreon, I just designed a high-voltage power supply that runs off of batteries that will end up operating something like this or a whole bunch of these things. So this would look really good as, you know, a display for an equalizer or some sort of spectral display, having a whole bunch of these things moving to different frequencies and all that. Or even just a, you know, a sound meter, something like that. Give you an idea of the level of sound around you, things like that. Very neat little device. So that's what this is. So now, for the next video's trivia question. Now I'm not going to turn this around because there's some writing on the other side that'll give it away. But what is this device? And where would something like this be used? So there it is. The next video's trivia question. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. I hope you enjoyed this video involving the Majestic Radio. If you are enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronics alike. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. If you want to be notified immediately when I post a new video, don't forget to tap the bell symbol as well. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and very effective way, you're going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. There's many topics up there and many videos as well. I'm also sharing many of my circuit designs and projects up there for everyone to build. So definitely check it out. I'll put the link just below the description and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comments section. Alright, until next time, take care. Bye for now.